We are going to um, continue our study of the book of Revelation uh, this morning. We're going to continue our study of chapter 16 of the book of Revelation as uh, we're going to pick up uh, beginning with verse 12. So if you'd like to turn your Bibles to Revelation 16, verse 12. We're in the final, actually the very final days of uh, the seven-year period of the tribulation. I would say that we're probably in the last month at least by the time we get to this point uh, in, in our study. And, uh, you know, although many are going to come to Christ during this time that we know as the Great Tribulation, uh, the Bible talks about coming from every uh, tribe, tongue, nation, and, and just going to be untold multitudes of people come to Christ. Most won't. And... Uh, uh, it says, in, uh, and one of the reasons for this, I think, is what it says in Second Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, uh, beginning with verse 9, where Paul writes, The coming of the lawless one is according to uh, the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteousness, deception among those who uh, perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So what Paul is saying in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is if you don't want to believe, fine. You know, God just says, okay, if, if you insist on that, if you want to say no to my grace, want to say lo, no to my love and mercy, then I'll just make it easy for you. I'll give you a spirit of delusion. Uh, and, and it says, uh, Jesus says in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, 22, he says, it's talking about this time period that we're looking at this morning. He says, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. I'm not talking about getting saved, salvations getting saved, like going to heaven getting saved, being saved like living getting saved. Uh, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, meaning Israel, those days will be shortened. Uh, and these would be the Jewish believers during the tribulation. You know, as we saw last week, all the fresh water sources are gone. I mean, they've long run out of Ozarka and Evian. You know, I mean, there's just, they're just no drinking water left. Uh, the sun is li literally toasting everyone. Uh, I mean, and they've run out of copper tone. I mean, it's just, it's, you know, it's dire, serious times. And uh, any one of the previous 17 judgments that God has allowed to be meted out on the earth should have been enough to cause someone to cry uncle, um, but to no avail. And, and this morning we're going to uh, talk about the last war. We're going to talk about war this morning. And so I just thought as, a, as an opening I wanted to share some uh, military jokes for all branches of the service uh, or uh, where dad jokes meet Delta Force, you know. Would, uh, what do you call a soldier who survived both mustard gas and pepper spray? A seasoned veteran. Okay, you guys are going to have to be a little faster than that. All right. Uh, the, as a group of Marine <laughs> recruits at Paris Island uh, stood at attention, the drilling sergeant shouted out, all right, all of you idiots fall out. Well, all of the platoon began kind of wandering away except for one man, one young recruit who continued to stay there uh, standing at attention. And so the DI went over and got right up eye to eye with him. And the young man looked at him and smiled and it says, there sure were a lot of them, huh, sir? <laughs> How many guns do you need in a firefight? Two. One to shoot at the enemy with and the other one to sell to the enemy so they can shoot back. That's kind of the way we do things. Uh, okay, this, this, is, this is kind of my fave, but that's just me. What do you call someone who just got run over by a tank? Crunchy. Uh, <laughs> why do military men always seem to marry their lovers uh, from foreign countries to which they've been deployed? Because when they come back home, they're thousands of miles from their in-laws. <laughs> now, that wasn't my favorite. The other one was my favorite. Okay, I, I, I made that very clear. That was Chuck's favorite. Um, <laughs> why don't Twitter users 
make good soldiers because they're too quick to retweet. <laughs> How do the different military branches use stars? Okay, the Army sleeps under the stars. The Navy navigates by the stars. The Air Force chooses hotels by the stars. <laughs> too close? Okay. What do soldiers do when they find a scorpion in their tent? Well, a Marine will kill the scorpion. An Army soldier will call his CO and report the presence of the scorpion. The Air Force airmen will call the front desk and ask what's the tent doing in his room. <laughs> That's even closer, isn't it? <laughs> A soldier runs up a hill and around a corner and he slams right into an officer. And, and the, the officer says, where do you think you're going, son? And he said, well, sorry, Captain. It's crazy out there and the firefight was just too heavy. And I got scared and I tried to go AWOL. Who are you calling Captain? I'm a general. He goes, oh, wow. I didn't realize I'd run that far back. <laughs> Where do generals keep their armies? Where do generals keep their armies? In their sleeveys, yes. That was Sherry's favorite. Okay, en enough? Yeah. About t 10 minutes ago, it was too enough. Okay, verse, verse 12. Then the, the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. Uh, if... For those of you that have been with us for the, uh, at least the majority of our time, we've seen a lot of parallels between the series of judgments known as the trumpet judgments and the series of judgments that we're looking at now, the bowl judgments. And uh, the uh, corresponding sixth trumpet was also about war, and this is where uh, the 200 million man army crossed over the Euphrates. And so uh, probably some sort of a connection between the two of them there. Um, it says that the river Euphrates was um, dried up to make way for the, the this, uh, army from the east, the kings from the east. The word east here is the word Anatole. And it, what it literally means is it just comes from a Greek word that means arising. Uh, you know, like the sun rises in the east. And so it just kind of generally means that direction. But here uh, in the text, it's not translated by most of the versions, but uh, here in the text, it also adds the word helios, which is the Greek word for sun. And, and so it, it, what it literally is, it's the kings from the rising sun. Uh, that the Euphrates, you know, the Euphrates has historically been the kind of dividing line between the east and the west, and and back uh, during uh, before mechanized warfare, you know, that was a big thing. Um, and uh, but I think during this time we'll be going back to the pre-mechanized warfare, and uh, uh, so it's going to be a thing then too. And and having the Euphrates uh, dry up uh, will make the those coming from that direction a lot easier because I don't think they're going to be flying over it at that time. He says in verse 13, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So we have those three entities here. We've got the, the, uh, the dragon, the seven-headed dragon, and we've got the, the beast, or, or we could say the fake Jesus, the, the Antichrist. And then we've got the false prophet, who is the fake prophet. And we've got the three of those. And, and this, is, uh, this is Satan's very pitiful and pathetic and, and uh, wretched and woeful attempt at an, an unholy trinity. You know, as he tries to, in every way he can, mimic God so that he can be as God, so, so that he can be viewed as God, uh, like God. And, and this is, he's going to orchestrate uh, these three entities, the, himself being the seven-headed dragon and then the Antichrist and the false prophet. Um, and it says, for they are spirits of demons, these frogs that are coming out of all three of their mouths. Uh, I guess it would be out of all nine of their mouths since the, the dragon's got seven heads. But um, they're spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and to the whole er world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. 
And then we have in verse 15, you see that's red letter, and we have the, uh, the Lord Jesus kind of inserting a comment here where he says, Behold, I'm coming as a thief. And blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And so even at this time, we have the Lord saying that, uh, you, you know, I mean, anybody that's, that's going to be paying attention, anybody that's going to be reading their Bible, uh, Jesus isn't going to be coming unexpectedly because we've got very clear timelines that are given to us prophetically in Scripture, but, but these people aren't going to be reading their Bibles. And so when he does come, it's going to be as a complete surprise to them. And he says he's going to come as a thief. You know, a thief... Uh, doesn't, you don't know when the thief's going to come or you'd be prepared for him. That's what Jesus says. And so he's going to come back and, and he's going to uh, take care of things. And it says, and they gathered them together, verse 16, to a place called in Hebrew Armageddon. Now, uh, you know, by the time we get, come to this place, this, this, this I mean, this uh, very I iconic scene, you know, the Battle of Armageddon, that's, I mean... Everybody has heard that phrase. Uh, most people may not know where it's at in the Bible, uh, but uh, you, you, everybody knows that phrase. Um, by the time we come to this, in these final days, the world is going to have been uh, beaten into an almost unrecognizable pulp. Uh, I mean, this is not going to be, th this world will not look like anything we've ever seen. Uh, uh, I mean, we, we often picture this as, as what we could call the mother of all battles, you know, and I've heard that phrase given uh, to this. Uh, and you, for those of you that are old enough to remember uh, when Saddam Hussein in Gulf War I, when uh, the troops were going over and he says if, they, if the U.S. And, and the coalition that George uh, Bush had put together, uh, it, it, when, when they come over, they're going to see the mother of all battles, you know, which it turned out to be kind of like a, a Fourth of July sparkler that didn't quite, you know, just fizzles out. Uh, and but that's gonna, that's, this is gonna make all other battles like that. That's how we have it viewed anyway. Um, I mean, all of the world's wars will have already have been fought by this time. And, and uh, whether we're talking at this point, World War III, four, five, six, or seven, don't know. But by the time we get to this point, um, the fallout from the previous wars, because, you know, the, the opening seals was, were wars. And, and so the whole tribulation has been nothing but uh, a, a series of wars. And by the time we get to this point, the toll has been taken the wars and the famine and the disease and pestilence and all that that comes in the aftermath of war. You know, it just, uh, if we look at the world superpowers, the, 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 the nations of the world today that have nuclear capabilities, Russia would be at the very top. You can see here 6,200 nuclear warheads. United States is right behind with 5,500. Then China uh, with 350, France, uh, UK, Pakistan, India, Israel. And North Korea doesn't have them yet, we don't think, but they have the, the uh, uh, material to do it. They just don't have, they, they just don't have uh, uh, the warheads built. And, and as we look at this list, this is some uh, 23 years after uh, the Treaty for the uh, Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Powers, Nuclear Weapons, was extended indefinitely. You know, they did it back in the 60s and for 25 years, and then after 25 years, they decided, let's just sign it and just make it indefinite. It's just going to go on forever. 25 years later, we still have this many nuclear weapons on the earth. And, and the, the fact that this is, uh, you know, the, these 13,000 plus warheads that we know of uh, is down from a level of a little over 20,000, so about 7,000 less than we had uh, a decade ago. And, be, and because we know that we have, uh, we're, we, we have uh, cooler and more uh, logical heads that are in, in uh, control of the buttons, that we can really be rest assured that we're in a safer place right now, right? I mean, I, I feel safer. Uh, 
you know, I was, I was reading this, this thing this week that said uh, uh, a, a lim- what they, they, they call limited nuclear conflicts. We don't have wars anymore because those are too dangerous. So we have conflicts, you know. And they said that, uh, uh, and, you know, Putin has threatened if, if, uh, if need be, he will do whatever is necessary to win in Ukraine. And he has is, he is, uh, uh, certainly implied that he would n- not hesitate to use limited nuclear weapons in order to win the battle in Ukraine. And, and, you know, where that would escalate from there could be anybody's guess. But it was recently, they did a study and they said that a conflict involving just, I mean, here, there's a bunch of them. You know, there's a bunch of them. Over 13,000. If just a a, a local nuclear conflict involving as little as 100 of them would result in a global nuclear war, or, or uh, uh, nuclear winner. Uh, it would have irreparable uh, uh, damage to the ozone layer. I mean, it would take millennia for the ozone, or, or, or centuries for the ozone layer to replenish itself. Um, the radiation from the sun would would be it would. You know, there'd be worldwide famine. In fact, uh, the National Weather Service and the EPA have established uh, this thing for determining uh, ultraviolet rays, you know, making sure that we all get the proper UV uh, protection. And they developed this scale from 1 to 10, with uh, 11 being the ultra-extreme, off-the-charts kind of level of uh, UV uh, exposure. If this conflict were to happen with as little as a hundred of these, some, 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 I'm not talking about World War III kind of bombing all, uh, all over the place. Just some sort of a limited local exchange of a uh, hundred or so of, of these nuclear weapons. Uh, they're saying that the UV uh, levels would be somewhere between uh, 15 and 20. D- double what the maximum scale will go to. Um, you know, we don't have any guarantees. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a pre-trib guy. You know, if you, I mean, I'm very, I'm, I'm very comfortably settled in the pre-trib, pre-millennial position. But we don't have any guarantees just because we think the rapture is going to happen before uh, the tribulation begins that this wouldn't happen before the rapture. You know, there's no, there's no guarantees that w- there wouldn't be some sort of a, uh, a nuclear uh, trade-off between a couple of superpowers uh, that could happen uh, while the church is still on this side of eternity. And um, I don't, I, we don't have any guarantees where it happened on this side of the rapture or not. Uh, but but if, 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 it, if it doesn't, I don't have any doubt that it'll occur on the post side after the church is raptured. You know, I, I'm, I'm certain it'll happen then. Um, and, and uh, you know, all this to say the so-called Battle of Armageddon uh, ain't, is really not going to end in so much of a battle, you know. I mean, on, on the, the side of the kings of the earth and the whole world, as we, we see there in the text, who ha- are, are gathered there at this place called the Valley of Megiddo for the, uh, the Harmageddon, as it says in the uh, uh, Greek, the, the mountain of Megiddo. Uh, they're going to see it as being the grandpappy of all battles. But from their perspective, that's how they're going to see it because they're, get, they're getting ready. You know, they've they're got all their sticks and their, their, their swords and they're getting ready to have a big fight. And, but Jesus comes back and he is going to just very, make very quick work out of them um, by the extremely sharp sword that pr- will proceed out of his mouth. It says in uh, Joel uh, chapter 3, Verses 12 to 14, it says, it's a prophecy of, of this time, and it, it says, Let the nations be wakened, and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will set to judge all the surrounding nations. Put on the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down, for the wine press is full. The vats overflow, and their wickedness is great. Multitudes 
multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. And I, I apologize for the repetition for some. I mean, I, those of you that have been coming every week and, ha and, and haven't fallen asleep, uh, you know, this is going to be very repetitious for you. And I, I, I do apologize uh, for that. But uh, for, the, uh, for the others, uh, let me just plot a couple of things on a map for you, just uh, so you have a, a, a point of context. Uh, the, the Valley of Megiddo is up uh, in the northern part of Israel, and it's a very huge, it's, it's the official name is the Valley of Jezreel or the Plain of Esdraelon. And it's a very large, it's almost 30 miles long and about uh, six to eight miles wide, depending upon uh, your measuring point. And uh, I mean, it is a huge, uh, flat, uh, very fertile plain. I mean, it's all, it's, uh, if you go there today, it's all farmland and, and Israeli Air Force Base. Uh, but it's a, it's a, you know, it's, it's a perfect battlefield. And, uh, but the Valley of, of Jehoshaphat, as we're going to see here, uh, it's only mentioned in this one uh, place in Joel chapter 3. And uh, from about the 4th century on, Fourth century A.D. on, it, we we don't have any reference to it in the Old Testament as to where it is. It's just that one reference in Joel three, but from the fourth century, early part of the fourth century on, uh, it has been identified with the Kidron Valley, which is that valley that starts. It's kind of on the east side of the uh, Temple Mount, starts right right at the northern part of Mount Moriah, uh, the Temple Mount area, and then it, it does make its way all the way down to the the Dead Sea. And, and this is, we know today as the Kidron Valley, but uh, very likely in the Old Testament times, uh, at the time of Joel's writing, it was uh, known as the Valley of Jehoshaphat. And I, th I think that whatever somebody thinks about the so-called Battle of Armageddon, you've, those that have been here have, have heard me say that. I don't really, it doesn't say that there is a Battle of Armageddon. There's no place in the Bible where it says that. It says that the armies gathered there to do battle. But it never does say that the battle took place there. And, and so regardless of where this conflict begins, and it very well could begin up in Megiddo, uh, it's going to end, I believe, down in Jerusalem. When Jesus comes back and he gathers his people from uh, Petra uh, there in modern-day Jordan and then comes up to Jerusalem and he puts his foot down on the Mount of Olives and... and uh, um, they come down, I think, uh, the Antichrist, the kings of the east, and also the kings of, of the north, probably reference to China and Russia. We can't be dogmatic about that. But uh, those three entities are getting ready to do battle, and the three of them decide to join forces and come down to Jerusalem to do battle with Jesus. And uh, just, you know, kind of a spoiler alert, it's going to end when Jesus does return puts his foot down on the Mount of Olives, and then slices and dices him with this very sharp sword that proceeds from uh, his mouth um, that we read about in Revelation chapter 19. And then that brings us to the seventh and last bowl, the very, very last of the judgments of the tribulation. The seventh bowl, verse 17 of chapter 16. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air. And a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. You know, one of the reasons why I believe that there's a strong correlation between the trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments is because the seventh trumpet judgment ends with the return of Christ. And so I don't, that's why, one of the, one of the reasons why I don't see them as being so sequential because here we got the six seven seals and then we got the seven trumpets and 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 that that seventh trumpet ends with the return of christ uh and and then we have here with the seventh bowl kind of the same thing where it says it says here uh, uh you know the seventh trumpet is when jesus comes and takes control and then uh, right here it says you hear this voice from heaven saying it is done i like kenneth weiss translation of this passage it says it has come to pass and is now an accomplished fact. Well, what is that that has come to pass and is now an accomplished fact? The return of Christ when he comes back the second time and, and, uh, and brings us with him. It's, it's, it's going to be a done deal then. Uh, 
It, as it says here, it is done. And it says in verse 18 that there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such uh, a mighty and great earthquake as not... Uh, check this out. For those that think that the book of Revelation is past, you know, the, the, there, are, there are those of, of Christianity who believe that this is all kind of a history book that we've been looking at. It says that there is an earthquake, great and mighty, as has not occurred since men were on the earth. You know, that was a pretty big earthquake they had uh, uh, in uh, Syria and Turkey recently. But that's not the biggest one ever. Uh, but this, this one is going to be the biggest one ever. In fact, uh, it, it, it says uh, uh, it, that it's going to be uh, a great and mighty earthquake as not occurred since men were on the earth. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25, the writer of the Hebrews tells us in verses 25 and 26, he says, See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also heaven. So when we think of this earthquake, don't be think it's, you know, maybe earthquake's not the right term for it. In fact, Second Peter, uh, in Second Peter chapter 3, verses 10 and 12, Peter writes to us and he says, But the, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away. The heavens will pass away. Check that out. It says, The heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. And so, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. So I, you know, maybe, I, I, I mean, I, maybe earthquake's not the right term here. I mean, Isaiah, as he prophesies from it, he says in Isaiah chapter 24, starting with verse 19, the earth is violently broken, the earth is split open, the earth is shaken exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall totter like a hut. Its transgressions shall be heavy upon it and it will fall and not rise again. You know, in light of what Hebrews and Second Peter and Isaiah says, maybe it's better to think of this as a universe quake rather than an earthquake. I mean, you know, the, the upside of this is Oklahoma will have beachfront property. I mean, that's kind of the good side of it, you know. You just, you know, uh, uh, but I mean, this is, this is going to be, this is wow, you know. And he says in verse 19, the great city, and I'm not, and people say, which, what great city is he talking about? I don't know. I mean, I could, I could argue Jerusalem, I could argue Rome, I could argue Oklahoma City, I could argue, you know, it just... It, uh, uh, Babylon, some people say Babylon, but literally the city of Babylon. It's The great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. We'll go into the identity of Babylon more over the next uh, couple of chapters. Um, but I just, just, spoiler alert, I don't know. You know, if it's literal or figurative, and if it's figurative, what it's figuratively speaking of. Um, but, it, but he says to give her, uh, going to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Uh, the word fierceness here in the New Testament uh, language is the word thumos. Our word uh, thermal comes from it. And it has the idea of hot anger. You know, some, some, you talk about people having a short fuse. This, this is a short fuse kind of a uh, thinking. Uh, passionate anger is the idea. But then the word wrath is the word orge, which means a, a, a settled disposition. It's, it's, a, it's like more measured and calculated. It's not just a knee-jerk reaction like Thumas says. This is something that's kind of like, okay, this is deserving of some very serious reactions, so what would be the best way for me to handle this? And, and, and we got both of those words used here. Uh, the only other time we see both, use, both words used together is back in chapter 14, uh, speaking of those who take the mark of the beast in Revelation 14, 10. And it says, he himself, meaning the person who takes the mark, shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out 
full strength into the cup of his indignation. And the word wrath here is the word thumos, and the word indignation is the word orge. And that's the only two times we see both of those words used together in um, the Revelation. Uh, John Wolverud, who, who uh, you know, he was a generation ago, but one of the best um, end times guys of the 20th century, I would say, um, he said this about this passage. He said, the combination of thumos and orge can, uh, connotes the strongest kind of outpouring of divine judgment. Uh, you know, it's kind of like if God say, okay, I'm going to judge, what would be the way that I could say it the strongest way? That, what would be the way that I could say it that would have the most impact? And that's what he's saying here. In fact, it says in verse 20, every island fled away and the mountains were not found. Great, uh, no, I mean, there, there are no more mountains. You know, there's no, no more Mount Everest. They're all, they're all gone. And great hail from heaven fell upon men, and each hailstone was about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of hell, since the plague was exceedingly great. Now, depending upon where you look, but, and, and I've, I've tried really hard to kind of nail this down, but it kind of appears that by the time of the New Testament, they had settled upon what was known as the Babylonian talent. But the, a talent was somewhere between 108 and 130 pounds. The Babylonian talent was 129.9 pounds. And that's generally where most guys believe that was being used by the time of John's writing. And that's each one of these hailstones was the... Uh, the, the largest hailstone ever recorded was in Vivian, South Dakota uh, back in 2013. It was eight inches. The fastest hailstone that was ever recorded was in 1970 in Coffeyville, Kansas, and it was tracked at 105 miles an hour. That's, that's fast. Uh, the heaviest was recorded in Bangladesh back in 1986, and it was just a little over two pounds. That's the heaviest we've, we've ever known. In fact, uh, the, the guy that measured the 8-inch one, he said it was really a lot bigger than that, but by the time he was able to pick it up and get it to his freezer, it had melted quite a bit. <laughs> I, I, I just, I mean, 130-pound hailstones. We've had some hailstorms here. I, 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 can, I, I can remember, we replaced our roof twice in 18 months at our house just because of the, the hail that we get here in Oklahoma. And, but... We're not even on that list of the largest, the fastest, and the heaviest, you know. <laughs> the, the, the penalty for blasphemy, would, oh, I meant, I'm sorry, I meant to take this out because I, I, as I did it, it, I thought it was too che cheesy. And I, I'm, okay, when did cheesy ever stop me? Okay, so the penalty for, for, Let's be serious. Okay, the, the penalty for blasphemy is given to us in Leviticus chapter 24, uh, verse 16 says, Whoever blasphemes in the name of the Lord shall be put to death, and the congregation shall certainly stone him, and the stranger as well as him who is born in the land. So to blaspheme the name of the Lord was a capital punishment that was meted out by stoning. And, and it says here that the people that are on the earth at that time are going to continue to blaspheme the name of the Lord. And so he's going to send these hundred plus pound hailstones. That's sobering. You know, I oftentimes hear people will describe as uh, maybe certain circumstances or situations or conditions, you know, they'll say, boy, this is, this is hell. Or they'll say, this is, the, you know, the, uh, you know I, I, yeah, I believe in hell because this is, this is hell on earth or something like that. I've heard that sort of phraseology used uh, quite a bit. Um, this will be the worst conditions that the world has ever faced since the flood. Second to none, Okay. And at least for the guys in the flood, their judgment was relatively swift. You know, I mean, they drowned. Um, these guys are going to be going through plague after plague after plague after plague after plague. 
But as bad as this future period on earth is going to be, it's still not hell. Even though it's unimaginably terrible. You know, here's what the Bible says about hell. It says that it will be a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 25, verse 30. It says that it'll be a place of outer darkness, which I think that that kind of implies it'll be utter loneliness. You know, people say, I'm going to go to hell and party with my buddies. Nah, not going to happen. You don't party in the outer darkness. Uh, it'll be a place of torments, and it's plural in Luke 16, where Jesus is telling the story about the rich man and Lazarus. And he says the La uh, Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom when he died, and then the rich man went to the place of torments. And, and he begs Jesus to, uh, or Abraham, to uh, send uh, Lazarus to put his finger in some uh, water and come and, and uh, uh, let, let his uh, finger touch on, on the rich guy's tongue because it's so excruciatingly hot and painful. And he calls it a place of torments, plural. Uh, it's called a place of everlasting destruction, Second Thessalonians um, Chapter 1, verse 9. And I, I don't really know how a place of outer darkness can also at the same time be a place that burns with fire and brimstone, but it will. Hell will be a place that burns with fire and brimstone, as we'll see in uh, chapter 22, verse 8 of Revelation. In fact, it goes on to say in Mark chapter 9 that it's a place where the fire is not quenched. See, I, 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 my brain doesn't... Picture that and outer darkness being in the same place, but it will be that in some way, shape, or fashion. Um, it's also a place of the bottomless pit, as it says in Revelation chapter 9. Or it'll be a place where there is no rest day and night, as it says in Revelation chapter 14. It'll be a place of unsatisfied desires, as the, the, this rich guy asked Jesus, or asked Abraham to send Lazarus to dip his finger in the water uh, because he just, he's just so painful where he's at. And, and, and thinking that uh, a finger dipped in water would somehow soothe his tongue, uh, and yet even that little bit of respite will be denied him. It'll be a place of uh, un unsatiated, unsatisfied desires. I think the desires will be great. In fact, they'll be greater than anything we've ever experienced on earth. You know, when you think of uh, whatever, whatever lust or drives or, or, or forces that, that uh, move you in this earth, there's nothing compared to what it will be like uh, in, in, in hell, and yet they will can be, be completely unmet. Not, not mostly unmet, but utterly unmet. Um, and then it will be, as Revelation chapter 20 says, a place of the lake of fire. But, you know, if there's, if there's a, something that we learn from the book of Revelation, that, and, and this is kind of, people don't get saved, uh, generally speaking, out of fear of judgment. You know, I, I, I certainly would say that that's not God's design. That's not his, that, that not his way of wanting to draw people into his kingdom is by scaring the hell out of them. Um, that's not, his, that he, it's not how he would want to do it. It, it's, it says in, in Romans chapter 2 that it's his goodness that leads us to repentance. That when he share, showers us with his love and his mercy and he shows us the way of the cross and we see the love that was poured out there, that's what, that's what leads us to repentance. That's what makes us want to long for the things of heaven. Um, not, not, not the fear of hell. I, I've, I've known people that do get saved out of a fear of hell, but that's certainly not God's preference. But, I, you know, I think there's, there's a very stark contrast between uh, the dudes of chapter 15 that we read about last week, the tribulation saints, and the dudes of chapter 16 that are continuing to blaspheme God. I mean, what a, what a stark contrast. The first group was focused on the Lord. 
You know, they weren't saying, uh, Lord, how come you didn't make yourself known to us before the tribulation happened where we wouldn't have to go through all of these hardships of the tribulation? And why didn't you send so-and-so to come and, and uh, the, 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 that person that's sitting at Calvary Chapel to, uh, this morning, why didn't you uh, tell, tell him to come and witness to me? Oh, you did tell him and he didn't do it. Well, why don't you just go get him because uh, the, you told him and they didn't do it? They're not doing that. Because not, their focus is on the Lord, and all they can do is just praise Him. They see His love and mercy extended to them, even at a time during a time of judgment. Whereas these guys in chapter 16, they're focused upon themselves. You know, and I, I think that we can just, we have, I mean, there was a book that was written. Uh, about 70 years ago. It was called The Calvary Road. It was written by a guy named Roy Hessian. And he was part of that group, maybe you've heard of it before, the Keswick Convention. It's a group of uh, British guys who just desire uh, the deeper walk of uh, holiness. And, and they do these annual conventions there in this uh, uh, place called Keswick. And, and uh, uh, yeah. And he wrote this book called Calvary Road that was kind of something that was born out of his desire to have a deeper, closer walk with the Lord. And I, just let me read a, a section from pages uh, 48 and 49 here, if I might. He says, In order to break our wills to his, God brings us to the foot of the cross. And there shows us what real brokenness is. We see those wounded hands and feet the face of love crowned with thorns, and we see the complete brokenness of the one who said, not my will, but thine be done, as he drank the bitter cup of our sin to its dregs. So the way to be broken is to look on him and to realize that our sin, which it was our sin which nailed him there. And then as we see the love and brokenness of the God who died in our place, our hearts will become strangely melted, and we will want to be broken for him, and we shall pray, Oh, to be saved from myself, dear Lord. Oh, to be lost in Thee. That, I might, it might not, that it might be no more I, but Christ who lives in me. Uh, there was a, a guy of my generation that was a, a really popular Christian. He was part of the Jesus movement thing and Christian musician. He was, he was a Christian blues artist. And for those of you that think that's an oxymoron. I just go to YouTube and check out Daryl Mansfield then uh, and look, at, look up some of his stuff. Uh, but I, he, he said to, about this, you don't have to go no further, brother. Just come to the cross. That's all we have to do. And, you know, when we were reading that passage earlier from 2 Peter chapter 2, where it's talking about the uh, universe being dissolved, all the elements of the universe, just intense heat thing. Uh, the very next verse, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And that's what I'm looking for. I hope you are too. Let's pray. Father, as we come to you this morning, we just thank you, Lord, for your extended love, um, steadfastness of your love. Lord, just the, the, the way that you continue to seek and woo and, and draw and lure and um, that you never get tired of that. You never weary of it. You just, you, it's not your will that any would ever come uh, before you without knowing your son, Jesus but that everyone would come to a knowledge of him. And, and God, I just, I, I pray as we find ourselves kind of in a place where I just, God, I just, I, I, I plead and I pray that there would be many others joining with me that we could look for a new, a fresh outpouring of your spirit. Um, where we could take our eyes off of ourselves and look to you that we wouldn't fear what you would have for us, but we would long for it. It would just be more desirous than any of the earthly pleasures that we could ever seek. 
we're so ripe for that, Lord. It's such a time that we need that. Uh, and so, God, we just, uh, we, we pray for that and ask that you would begin uh, even now in this place, that you could even begin, Lord, with us, that you could begin with me as we seek you and your love. To you belongs the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. There's a thing that we do every Sunday at this time um, as we, um, you know, I'd mentioned that the team was going to come up and we'll close this with a couple of worship songs, but I also mentioned that I'm going to go to the back of the auditorium where I'll meet with some other people uh, uh, and we're, we're available for prayer and people will come back for prayer for various needs. Uh, you know, maybe they, a lot of times they'll come to church with the uh, mindset that when at the end of the service, when they when it's time for prayer, I'm going to go back and get one of the prayer ministry people to pray for for me or for a family member or for a situation I'm facing or something, and and encourage you to do that. That's what this time is going to be for, and uh, it's going to be really good to be able to. Uh, it's it's just sweet to pray together, um, and so as we close in worship, and you would desire prayer. Um, Please come back. As I go back and gather my stuff and go to the back of the room, just you can come back uh, as I do and come to any of us that are standing back there, and we'd be more than happy to pray with you. Uh, it, it's, it's very possible, and this happens quite often too, that there's something from the text. This is a powerful text. I understand it. Uh, it just, I mean, just through the whole book, it's just kind of been amping up more and more and more and more, and we're, we're kind of getting to the apex of it now. Um, but it could be that there's something that's pretty dynamic about the text that has ministered to uh, a particular, has resonated with you in some specific way, and you'd like to respond to that. Um, you know, there's a number of ways you could do it. You could do it right where you're standing. You could just go to the Lord yourself with whatever whatever he's speaking to the need of your heart, you could take it directly to him. You could ask the person next to you or nearby to you to pray for you if you wanted to. Um, you could do that, or you could come uh, back and let one of us pray for you. Um, you know, it, it, it could be, I think it's, it's you know, extremely possible on, on a, any given Sunday when we have a room full of people like this that it's very possible that there could be somebody here uh, who doesn't know that they are one of Jesus' people, you know, that they, they, they don't know that, uh, that you could be here this morning and you don't know that you belong to the Lord, that you, uh, we use the term saved or that you were born again. Um, you say, well, I think I am, but I don't know. Well, I, I can, let me tell you how you can know. Uh, it doesn't happen by church membership or doesn't happen by being a good person or doing good stuff. It doesn't hap happen by anything that we do other than there's only one thing that we can do that could uh, allow us to become one of God's children, and that is surrender. Uh, because uh, no, there's nothing we can do that can make us good enough for him uh, because his standard is perfection, and all of us fall short of that. We, every one of us are sinners. And, and uh, none of us can go to him by our works, by our efforts, and, and, make, uh, and, and God would, would uh, be moved to embrace us on that uh, basis. Um, and, and so that, that kicks out all of us. You know, uh, we have all inherited Adam's sin. And, and so what God did to rectify the matter is that he himself became one of us the only perfect human being that's ever lived uh, when he came to earth as his son, Jesus. And uh, he lived the perfect life. And yet he, he died a sinner's death. He died as though he had committed he, uh, a, a very vile sin. He was uh, charged with guilt, uh, sin of blasphemy. Uh, and he didn't blaspheme. And as we saw, that was a capital offense. And, and, uh, but he, he went to the cross paying the penalty uh, paying God's price for sin for all of us. He took the place of judgment for all of us so that God's 
sin debt was satisfied. The, the things that had separated us from him, meaning our sins, was paid for through Christ's sacrifice. And, and he died as though he, he took our death, the death that you and I are deserving, he took in our place. Um, and, uh, but the wages of sin is death, uh, Paul tells the Romans, and so death couldn't hold him because he hadn't sinned. Even though he died as though he did, he didn't. And so he rose on the third day. And he has promised that anybody that comes to him in surrender, anybody that comes to him and just takes their hands off of their life, recognizes that he paid the price for their, for their sins. He rose on the third day. And, and he said, anybody that comes to me and, and calls upon me as Lord, which means I'm not Lord of my life anymore. I want you to be God. He says he will save. And that's got to be a choice that each and every person makes. You, it doesn't happen any other way. Um, you can't dream yourself into heaven. You can't wish yourself into heaven. You can't work yourself into heaven. You can only surrender yourself there. And if you've never made that volitional choice, then you're probably not the child of God. And, and I would just say that today would be the day that you would make that choice. Um, and so as we close out in worship, uh, please uh, come back and let one of us pray with, with you and ju just say that you're, you're wanting to give up. You're wanting to surrender your heart to him. Uh, and you could, say, you could do that right where I was. When I was in a situation similar to this and I was standing just as you are, I, I did it right where I was standing. I just surrendered my heart to the Lord right where I'm standing. Um, and I didn't have to go to somebody and have them pray for me. You don't have to do that. Uh, but it's a good way. It's a good thing to do. Um, that, but I would only say that if you do that, uh, that before you leave today, you would come and let somebody know. You know, I would love to have you come by and just tell me that you, you did that surrender thing. Uh, I, would, I would love that. Just want to encourage you. And so um, if that's you, uh, don't think that you got to think about it and mull it over. Because I, I, I tell you, the devil will rip that off before you can get out of the building. Uh, um, make make the choice today while, while there's that chance. Um, and the um, rest of us, we're just going to have a time of worship. Re remember, uh, this Saturday you can get to the theater. Uh, we're in um, auditorium uh, number 20 at Tinseltown. Christian will be right inside the door in the lobby there and see him, and he will give you your ticket, your voucher, uh, that you can get on into the theater then. And, and it starts right at 3 o'clock, so... Uh, don't wait till 3 o'clock to get there because then you'll be late for the beginning part of the movie. So get there at 2.30. Then you have time to pay $20 for a tub of popcorn as well. Okay? All right. God bless. <laughs>